Now I'll get right to the point. I'd like for you to listen to a story about a radio, so you can know what sort of person I am. Yes, a radio. Actually, I was terribly addicted to news for a long time. I wonder if you see what I mean. I couldn't stand it if there weren't fresh news reports coming in one after the other all the time. Battlefield situations go on changing minute by minute. Moving picture stars and singers keep marrying and divorcing. Rockets go shooting off to Mars and a fishing boat sends off an SOS and blacks out. A pyromaniacal fire chief is apprehended. When a venomous serpent escapes from a load of bananas and an employee of the Ministry of International Trade and Industry commits suicide and a little girl of three is raped, an international conference achieves great success and ends by collapsing. A society is formed to breed sterilized mice. A child is discovered buried in cement at the construction site of a supermarket. The total number of deserters from troops throughout the world sets a new record. The world seems to be boiling over like a tea kettle. The globe's capable of changing shape the minute you take your eyes off it, even for a second. I took seven different newspapers. I set up in my room two television sets and three radios. When I went out, I never let a portable radio out of my hand. And when I went to sleep, I left the earphones plugged in. I got different news reports on different stations at the same time, and there could be special news broadcasts at any moment. Timid animals keep too close a watch around them, and gradually, like the giraffe, their necks stretch. Or like the monkey, they can become incapable of coming down out of trees. Don't laugh. For the one afflicted, it's serious. He spends the greater part of the day just reading and listening to news. Angry with the weakness of his own will, still with aching heart, he is unable to separate himself from the radio or television. Of course, I was very much aware that no matter how much I went rooting around for news, I wouldn't necessarily come closer to the truth. I realized that, but I couldn't stop. Perhaps I needed the news form, which is summarized in cliches, not truth or experience. In short, I was thoroughly addicted to news. Hey, this is Nathan. This is Nick. This is David. And welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. On this episode, we're talking about Kobo Abe's 1973 novel, The Boxman. This is a really strange, surreal journey through the labyrinthine scribblings of a boxman, or boxmen, or a doctor pretending to be a boxman who's covering up a murder, or a boxman who pretended to be a doctor, or all the above, or none of the above. <laughs> so this is a really bizarre book about all sorts of things, like voyeurism and identity, self-abdication, absurdity, societal failure, the need to tell a story, and yet it's all done in this really funny, sometimes frustrating, dreamlike novel without being overtly moral or pushy, and yet the novel really sort of carries you along and wraps you up in its strangeness. So if you haven't read it, definitely check it out, listen to the podcast, enjoy. So I think one of my deficiencies uh, that I've noted in doing this podcast is that I kind of miss some of like key plot details, character things, all, all of the details under that umbrella. So who wants to actually try to summarize the plot (laughs) details of this Uh, book? I I will try (laughs) and inevitably fail at doing so. (laughs) So essentially this is a narrative about a man who can probably go by the letters A through D, I think. We can assume he's all of those characters. <laughs> so the plot is that there's there's a man who lives in a box. He's become a box man, and he is narrating to us, the reader, what it means to be a box man by giving us little narratives of people that may or may not be him, as well as telling a story, a, a sort of detective surreal narrative about his adventures with a possibly evil, possibly doppelganger, possibly schizophrenic part of himself, doctor and nurse, whose legs he's quite into. This (laughs) is one possible narrative. 
And all of this is written on the inside of his box or on random scraps of paper. I think there's another possible narrative, which is that the doctor invented the box man to to maybe get away with murder. But I don't know. <laughs> Wait, let's let's unpack. You mentioned okay. So, question for any listener who is now completely yeah. confused. Let's let's unpack the the A through D oh, comment. Okay. What is, what does that okay, mean? Okay. So, throughout his narrative of his adventures and misadventures with the nurse and doctor at the abandoned hospital up on the hill near the uh, soy sauce factory, <laughs> he has these little breaks in narrative that sort of give a possible history of his own life and how he became to be a box man. Although that's not admitted, it's implied. There are these narratives that talk about someone's, like a brief moment in someone's life. So there's, in the very beginning, there's the case of A, and A is, you know, just your average average Japanese businessman who lives in a city that is known as T, which is probably Tokyo or some version of it, who first sees a box man and becomes obsessed with the idea of what he saw. Then there's B, and it's a brief narrative about, I think, the death of a box man who may or may not be a hobo. Yes. Yeah, yeah I was trying to take notes on that one because that one's really, really kind of lightly touched on. But yeah, it's, it's an owner of a box that the box man who goes to the hospital yes. finds and he surmises that that either the box itself or the box man itself died. Yeah, he, he so often refers to it. They, they, yeah, kind, they of kind of blend. blend. He, ref, he kind of discovers the box and treats the box as a as a corpse and writes about what he imagines this life was, which may or may not be his own imagining of himself dying. Well, we'll get to that. But and then there's, there's C. I don't remember C off the top of my head. C... Was the writer of yes. the affidavit? Yes, he is the writer of the affidavit who <laughs> claims to have taken the identity of the doctor after the his military experience. Yes. yes. Okay, you're <laughs> almost there. Keep going. <laughs> and D is, I think, at the very end of the novel. He refers to his... Oh, no, D is the child. Sorry. The oh, childhood right. story about right. the voyeur experience, because this book is a lot about voyeurism and which kind of Nathan alluded to in his news quote at the beginning. A lot about watching and how watching, whatever, we'll get into it. But yeah, D is the story of this young boy who gets caught crafting this weird device to spy on a, uh, a young piano teacher. And then through his voyeurism gets caught, and then he's sort of treated as she treated him. Like she like forces him to strip, and she observes him from a distance and makes him like all sorts of uncomfortable. There's a lot of, a lot of weird relationships between being looked at and looking at throughout this whole this whole book Mm -hmm. yeah so those are the those are a through d real quick uh on the a through d which which one is it who's the the drug addict that they pull out of the river that's b right is that b it it, i think it's implied to be b but is it not clear (laughs) hence hence the i mean welcome to the central (laughs) question of this book are they separate? Are they not? Is it? Does it evolve? Is it one narrator? narrator How, you know? So it's interesting, David, hearing you describe that because I'm like, ah, okay. I could not pull that together. And I was like, maybe, I'm j- maybe I shouldn't try to pull it together. Maybe it's surreal and it's not supposed to come together. These are, I mean, the book is so weird. It's, it, I, found it re- I found it really hard to follow who I and you are were throughout the book mm-hmm. so i kind of just gave up i said okay i'm just i'm here for the ride i'm not gonna try too hard to figure it out i i like that you say that because that's also how i read it and then about 30 minutes before we sat down to do this i kind of was like oh shit i don't know what this book's about <laughs> <laughs> so i went back to the whole thing i have this huge like page of my detective notes about it but then i was like does this really what happened <laughs> and i think that's yeah like that's essentially I think the different narratives that that David mentioned is that you can read it as individual people and these events are happening, but even the, they're not even minor characters, but everybody continually exchanges identities, right? And then there's even these comments about the, uh, essentially the written Mm -hmm. record of this narrative. It's referred to as changing paper, changing handwriting, changing basically how it's documented, which essentially 
implies that there is no consistent narrator that the box man is more of an entity that you can sort of drift into and yeah, out it, of well and in addition to that the sort of comment commentary within the text upon the text there's also like pages that are all black with photographs and kind of like little poetic statements that you mean his material proof that he has is that, he that what that is i guess i guess <laughs> which is not proof of anything yeah, the relationship between those pages and the rest of the book is kind of oblique. It's like a scrapbook collection, and there's a loose connection, as far as I could tell. So I guess it just seemed the the delivery of the story seems so surreal that I thought maybe he's playing around with stuff, and I shouldn't have tried too hard to make clear what he's saying. Well, so the... Let's talk about the the photos, right? Because there's kind of two categories. There's the initial one, which is just the negative that is supposed to be documenting the man who shot him with an air rifle. Correct? Yeah. And that that's basically how the story opens. And you're right. From that, it's you can't discern anything. It's kind of like a really confusing Seabold, right? It's just tiny on the page, and you want to attribute something to it, but it's just so small and almost irrelevant that it's just, it's hard to, yeah, it's hard to use for anything more than that. And then there's the, I think there's eight of them, the eight kind of spliced in photos that then have this page of black and and kind of some small text below it. And I'm pretty sure Abe took those photos he did, himself. Yeah. And you can read them a couple different ways, but but one way that makes sense to me is that they're just evidence of the main i don't even want to say main character but the main voice always refers to himself as a photographer in his pre-box man life to me i attributed that of just sort of documenting his photography and kind of using that as a jumping off point but as to how it relates to the narrative i i don't have a fully formed can i throw out a uh i I know i said i'm not going to try to figure out this book but um that's what we're here to do. A, well, here's my <laughs> here's my shot. Um, Abe himself was a photographer in some respect, and um, I guess th- there's a quote I was looking for about um, what the photograph does to a scene and it, how a photograph makes. No, he's not actually. He's talking about looking outside the box. The frame of the box flattens everything and makes everything equal, and that's very similar to. Um, an idea of photography that photography is an equalizing medium once you look through the camera you are no longer in the scene you are looking at the scene and so this this you know the, the box man is the outsider he's in society but he's outside of society looking at it in it, not dissimilar to a you know street photographer who's there but attempting to not be there and objectifying it through the lens of the camera which is in a way a box with a slit in it. I buy it. Is there something larger than that that's being said about either this particular person that the narrative is about? Well, I, I think, um, in my opinion, it's, it's it's yeah, I agree with you. It's not just about photography. Um, but I think it's, photography isn't just about photography either. I, the The desire to step outside and be separate in order to look on and even without understanding, just to look on and not be sucked up into everything that's happening. Maybe in a way to become oneself, to identify with oneself, not with you know this manic society. Maybe, maybe that's kind of what it's about. Or maybe it's about being pushed out of society and then finding oneself as a photographer or as a box man because you, know, you are now like kind of squeezed out of the organism or you feel yourself squeezed out of the organism. I, I think the criticism is on both ends of that spectrum i think it's one what kind of society pushes people to this limit and then once people try to remove themselves from society and view the world as this thing they can't you know Mm -hmm. you can't exist like this clearly you're either driven mad to this point or you're driven to this point and then further are driven into madness to where you need to find some sort of way to coexist and that being a box man, whether or not it's part of societies or yourself sort of abdication, an abdication of, of selfhood. Mm-hmm. I think there's some critique in there 
that might exist outside of just existential, the box man is really just the prison house of your own skull kind of Beckett thing. I think, I think there might be something <laughs> other than that, but it's, it's really hard to get at what that is, if it's there at all. So my take on it is when reality becomes so irrational, suddenly an extremely irrational step, putting yourself inside of a box and living there, becomes the most rational thing that you can do, right? So if you basically, going back to the photography analogy, that it gives you essentially two things. It gives you anonymity and it gives you the ability to be a voyeur, essentially. And so it's almost like a conscious decision to step outside society and to also watch it, watch basically the train wreck from afar, right? And so it's funny, for as crazy as a lot of this seems, I think there is an underpinning analysis of the choice to disconnect from the world because the world itself has gotten to that point, essentially. So I view it more in that direction rather than the box man or box men being pushed to it. It's almost like a, a decision to you know, remove yes. oneself. In this narrative, at least, I think that is exactly right. I think maybe we're putting, and we might even be putting more there than is actually there in the book because Abe doesn't show us reality. Yeah. Doesn't show us the everyday. Like, it's all insanity. It's all madness. It's all, and it's all inside the box, right? I mean, there's there's constant references to that. Everything we're reading, whether or not we imagine it's, a different change of stationary. There's references a couple of times, especially near the end, that it's all just weird notes written on the inside of this box. That's all it is. Is there? I mean, can we trust that? You can't. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Good like point. it's the most unreliable narrator. I <laughs> yeah. don't know. Ah. I want to read a little fragment of a thing that had me laughing today, just trying to explain like the unreliable narrator aspect. It's just. Perhaps I'm the one writing. Perhaps it is I who am going on writing as I imagine you who are writing as you imagine me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I don't fucking know. <laughs> There's another quote, and this kind of gets at what Nathan talked about. And this is part of, I think, that interaction between Boxman and fake Boxman. And that he says something like, A falsehood deceives and makes one stray from the truth, but imagination can be a shortcut leading one rather to the truth. And Nathan, you were kind of hinting at this, not only in the news article, news quote, but also just before we kind of broke off, is the unreliability of the narrative. Is there a point at which it's pushed so far that you really can't know a truth? And does that make the book unreadable? <laughs> It's interesting that we can even have a conversation about a book that seems to have succeeded with all of us to have thoroughly confused us. <laughs> and, you know, that, that that even with that, there's some there's some truth in the narrative that we can talk about, which is maybe, you know, the point of success of the book. It's like, I mean, it, this isn't like Le Spectre at all, but in a similar kind of way, it kind of put me in a brain fog. At a certain <laughs> point, I just had to like stop trying to think my way and just kind of feel my way through the book. And then there's this, there's definitely a feeling of madness and alienation. Um, what was your question? <laughs> yeah, the question was, with, with such an, unre and this is for both of you, with such an unreliable narrator and narrative, does, does it, I really enjoyed it. And yet we are having such a hard time explaining really what the fuck this book is about. Or is trying to do, the only two things I can think of is trying to understand yourself in relation to how you see the world and how the world sees you. It's about, it seems to be about perception. A lot of this book is about perception. Mm -hmm. But what is it saying about that? I have no idea. It's so twisted and slippery and surreal that it's really hard to get a hold of anything. I think there's, there's the perception, the perception aspect. But then kind of a common theme in Abe's, well, not an Abe expert. I've only read The Woman in the Dunes. Um, I watched the film last night, which is fantastic. Yeah. So I've got a lot of this on my mind. Um, but there is essentially this question of submission, mm. I think, that uh, shows up in Abe's stuff, which is how do, you, how do you essentially overcome the madness of it all? Because it's 
there's such madness and it surrounds you to such a degree that oftentimes his characters choose a much more simple path at the expense of basically removing themselves from society. There's essentially, there's a line from, um, I watched uh, Pitfall, which is another uh, Teshigahara that uh, Abe wrote the screenplay for, so it's not based on an Abe novel. But there's this one moment where essentially, you know, characters die and they exist in purgatory, and the one character wants to figure out why he was killed, and another character who's in purgatory just says, it doesn't matter, just get used to it. It's the sooner you let go of that, the happier you'll be, because you can't change anything. And there's always this moment of submission in in Abe stuff that I've overlapped with, certainly in The Woman in the Dunes. And in this, it's it's more complicated because it's, did multiple box men submit? Did they not? But I think the whole point is that this choice is essentially a submission into a lifestyle that somehow is the most rational thing. Where are you getting that? And even the, though... So like Women in the Dunes, I, like there's a clear outside force making this character submit to whatever this new identity is that he's about to become, right? Whereas mm-hmm. in The Boxman, there's no clear indication not really that anything about the world outside is is forcing this and that this choice is a rational choice well we have uh we have a couple like some of the news snippets that are put in there i mean not necessarily the quote that nathan read although mm. that's part of it but i think it starts out with a description of people living on the street and how the authorities cleared them mm-hmm. out right uh, and then there's another news clipping that talks about, uh, I think it's a person who died, but 100,000 people walked yes. by them, right? Which these are, you know, living in San Francisco, these are things that I actually ask myself every day, right? Just interacting in the city, there's this question you have for yourself is, you know, being surrounded with a relatively large homeless population, being surrounded with a city that feels sometimes like it's falling apart, is this total madness? At what level, like, am I being complicit in just being here, right? Is it make more sense to completely, you know, separate myself from this, to choose something that may be inherently more mad, but in comparison to the madness that exists in the outside world, maybe it's more rational. I still don't, I don't, I still don't see the rational argument for why. The, I mean, the rational argument is just limiting I guess it, it overlaps with like the photography and the slit in the box. It's just limiting your exposure to it because it's just too much. So by confining yourself, you're essentially controlling your yeah. own domain, which is the only thing you have. But I, I do agree. This this one is this book versus other Abe stuff feels even more vague in that mm. respect. So I might be connecting some dots here. But essentially that's the that's the feeling I get Got from this is is struggling with ha- with one's relationship in society and and what to do when it seems so it crazy. It seems it seems to me less that he's making any any sort of logical argument, but more I guess you could draw a logical inference that in the face of absurdity, any response is absurd. And I think he does paint. Yeah, and it's not you know I think maybe as twenty first century humans. It's we're familiar with the absurdist idea that it's hard to th- that meaning is maybe not necessarily there. Maybe it's absurd, and he's writing in that vein. So maybe we're applying a little bit of that to this. This isn't a, f- a totally fresh idea, right? To call the world absurd and then off off you go. Um, maybe it reminds me maybe of a little bit of like Master and Margarita in like that regard. Like what what, what can you pull from it? Um, you have to accept this this absurdity, and maybe there's not a clear moral or you know message in it, other than wow, things are absurd. But I think it does a slightly better job than that. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna attach this to the House of Leaves episode that you guys did that I did not do and have not read the book. <laughs> but the end paragraphs of this refer to yeah. labyrinths, and so I wanted to ask you guys about this. And essentially, the topic of uh, of that book, as I understand it, is basically this this postmodern truth: there is no truth, the absence of anything; it's all subjective. 
And when it got to the labyrinths at the end of this, talking about how the writings on the inside of the box are essentially labyrinths within labyrinths, I, A, was like, oh, maybe that's that's overlapping this same territory. But B, I wondered if this did a better job with that concept for you guys because the amount that it made me kind of question stuff was really there. And it sounded like when you guys read House of Leaves, you're like, ah, most of this is for show. Actually, that that same thought occurred to me reading this because I made the comment in the House of Leaves episode that I, I didn't sort of buy or I didn't feel the effect of all these semiotic tricks that he was doing just, you know, with the way that he displayed text versus in this book, I did get that, get more of that feeling with the actual photographs, with the news clippings of sort of the, the, uh, injection of these other formats into this. I don't know if that's exactly what you were talking about, but that, that comparison occurred to me also. I want to, I want to read a couple of the, I guess they're headings, chapter yeah. breaks. Those are titles. some of the best things. I don't know, but <laughs> some of these are super good. So one is, in which it is a question of the sullen relationship between the I who am writing and the I who am being written about. So that's a good one. Uh, I like this one. In his dream, the box man takes his box off. Is this the dream he had before he began living in a box? Or is it the dream of his life after he left it? And there's plenty more of these. But uh, if those are so good, wh- wh- why is that? I don't know. It, it's like a, it's like such a perfect summary of all of the contents, but it's also very funny, I think. Yeah, because right? it's so absurd. Yeah, exactly. It's making fun of that level of absurdity that to try to put it into chapter headings is just completely comical. And I think there's an awareness in the novel, too, of all that. And it's uh, the best example is those headings. I don't know where to go from here, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we need to maybe pull back from this absurdity track. There's only... Yeah. Once we start down the absurdity only... tunnel, it's... Um... You're, you're beating a dead box. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the question I want to pose, which is, fundamentally, is it one narrator who's possibly schizophrenic, has different identities, or is it different narrators who are documenting all potentially inside the same box what's your take my take is that it's it's one narrator why i think the a b c d glimpses into these different lives feel too too much like breadcrumbs to the narrative and the this character's sort of history it feels like these sort of little psychological clues as to how he became who he became and what he imagines his death will be like because that's From the very beginning, he's under the bridge waiting to die or get murdered, he assumes. And whether or not that that's a reality, I I don't, I tend to think it's not, but there's not enough stability, which makes it all unstable, which makes me feel it's all one narrative. I I think my take is that (laughs) it's a bit like it both is it is one narrator narrator and it's not i just it doesn't seem clean enough to me that it's one narrator that it's that it's this one character who's losing his mind or or whatever and that this is just the scribbles on his box um it has one sort of tone throughout even though it does kind of change its voice a little bit and i think maybe there might be like news clippings but again i think that's him like re-scribbling sort of retranslating these these news articles that he may or may not have been obsessed with in the past. So what about the scene? This is going to be a plot mm. question. So asterisk on this. What about the scene in which the narrator goes to essentially the hospital? And I think it's after uh, he receives a letter that's trying to buy his box off of him. So he basically sheds the box temporarily, goes to the hospital, and then finds the doctor in a box, but he's a fake box man. The doctor's in the box, and the box is exactly the same as his. Mm -hmm. But then there's also, um, is is it the nurse or or assistant? And that's that scene in which she is taking her clothes off, and 
the entire Again, time he in can, my head, he can it seems like his little his little mirror thing, like he did when he was a child. There's that that connection there, right? But I guess that that main scene to me implied that there was a movement amongst the identities that almost the box itself was was consistent, and these people sort of moved in and out of it. But what I can't figure out is then there's also in the affidavit section where the person admits that they basically took over the identity of the doctor as the doctor succumbed to being addicted mm-hmm. to drugs. So there's also this fluid identity that is separate of the box man. It's kind of like a precursor to that. That was how I read it. Yeah. So in, in my head, A, B, C, D are all the, it's, it's almost essentially the past of the box man. He might have been a doctor at one point or pretending to be a doctor at one point. I think he was definitely the child. I think B is him imagining his death because I think the entire narrative is him telling his story as he's preparing for death. That's how I imagine the narrative. And that he's sort of reconciling hmm. who he was and who he is. But he can't do that. So this is, this is kind of like the Charlie Kaufman movie. Yes. I'm thinking Holy of shit. things. <laughs> this is really like I'm thinking don't, of many things. Don't 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 ruin it. I haven't watched oh. it yet. Oh, yeah, you got. You I got want to go in fresh, like Frank right. Costanza. All right, well, it's nothing. It's nothing <laughs> like this book. No details. Yeah, yeah. I just okay. <laughs> but okay, wait. So, question. I was thinking I was going over my detective notes here. So, case A is a non-box man who's living, like you mentioned earlier, kind of a regular life. Mm. And he shoots a box man with an air rifle. And then the negative that is shown at the beginning of the narrative sort of implies that it's the picture from the box man of the man who shot him with the air rifle. But the whole reason that the, I guess I'm just going to say narrator because who the hell knows, that the narrator goes to the hospital and gets him in this into this situation with the doctor and his Yours? nurse is because he was shot with the air rifle. You're right? assuming he actually ever goes to the hospital. You're assuming that that's reality. <laughs> I don't think that that's reality. Oh, wow. Because at, at the very everything. end of the book, he's bleeding and hearing an ambulance, supposedly. <laughs> Again, every everything is... <laughs> I feel okay. like we have to we have to couch this in like legal terms, like you know. <laughs> I want to try to describe how I interpreted this book, and that is something like there are no box men; it's a symbol for something. There is no narrator. The narrator moves through people's heads who are also interchangeable. There is no there is no common thread here, except that we are alienated in modern society. And find ourselves at any given point feeling like a box man. And maybe we decide to act on that or maybe not. And he keeps confusing us by hinting that this is the same person and dropping these breadcrumbs. But there's no connection and we're not connected to each other, but we all feel alienated. It's a metaphor, man. (laughs) (laughs) File under Nathan's interpretations of symbols <laughs> okay so we are all box men we are interchangeable when we look at other people we are essentially doing some sort of mimetic projection saying okay that could be me because it might as well be because what the fuck's the, what does it matter um you know i'm always the same whether i'm in this box or that box and as long as i have a nurse with good gams who gives me enemas i'll be okay is that what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. I mean, it would be satisfying if I, I like your interpretation, but like you said, even in your interpretation, there's a lot that you have to assume because it's it, the whole everything you read is very unreliable, and you just kind of have to decide: okay, was is that one? Is that a real tro- story? Is that a true story? Is that imagined? Is that this character? Or is he writing about somebody else? Is is he writing about someone else as himself? And my opinion is because it's a book, Abe's kind of toying with us by mixing up, you know, people's minds. To what end? (laughs) There is no end. I mean, I think, I think the end (laughs) is that, is this idea that, uh, uh, there's at least an absurdist element to modern society that we have to, 
What? It's a bit too. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't do any good to acknowledge it. It doesn't, you, you were just confronted with it. And this is a confrontation. This is Abe's way of confronting the reader with that absurdity. So in the, in this extended metaphor, do we, do we choose to put the box on and remove ourselves from society while observing it? Or is that just, that's an inevitability? I think it's a, it's a sort of inevitability and he presents it that way. Like, um, you, you think that you are free. And I think in our, you know, modern liberal society, that's fundamental, it's a fundamental idea that you are free and you make free choices. So why would a free person choose to do this? What caused this free person to be obsessed and shoot this other box man if that happened and put the box on his head? And I think- Because he chose to, or he maybe not chose, but he has removed himself from the absurdity of the world and you can't stand it. It's like people hate what they don't understand. So this A character in the beginning is like, fuck that guy. He's not a part of society. I, and like think, it, it, it riles him. Is that what you're saying? Well, he was confronted with the absurdity. And then once he was confronted with the absurdity, you know, maybe he was living his normal life and it didn't feel absurd. And then this box man is the absurdity that he's confronted with. And he wants to eliminate that. He wants to not be confronted with absurdity. But that wall is broken now and he can't escape the absurdity. Are you taking agency away from the box man? The choice of being the box man? Versus the inevitability of being a box man. I mean, I, I think to some degree he does that. I mean, Abe does that. Like he, the which character is it? A who is shot or A who A is the guy who shoots the box man <laughs> in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, it's essentially. I think that's that's the core question. Is is yeah? Does do any of us have any agency when confronted with this this absurd scenario in which we call life? My answer is yes. Abe's answer seems to be. If this book, if that's the question of this book and this narrative is the answer, the answer is no. Whether we have a choice, is that the question? I still read it kind of as yes, but also I'll note that, you know, I never read things in the symbolic manner. I'm more of a literal person. So I kind of thought this was like a law and order episode. <laughs> hence why I was taking yeah. my notes and being like, oh, if if Boxman A <laughs> killed Boxman B <laughs> in the parlor with Air the... Rifle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the benefits of this text is exactly this conversation we're having, which is there's in no way explicitly said one way or another. Mm. I, I want to sure. bring up two pieces of evidence. Okay. I didn't highlight them, but so I'm going to paraphrase. But at the beginning, he references that you have all seen box men. They're right in plain sight, but you probably didn't notice them. Now you could say that's because they're in a cardboard box and you don't notice the cardboard box. Or you could say, because that person looks like a person and you don't realize that they are, they've confronted the absurdity. Point A. Point B, at some point later in the book, he says something along the lines of, which of us at some point in life has not been a box man? Something along those lines. So there's a quote, if a ghost is something that is not visible, yet which one has the impression of being able to see... A box man is just the opposite. And there's a few instances of that idea of the box man being this sort of ghostly, non-present entity sort of drifting through the world, which I think people kind of assume is not watching, but is watching. Mm -hmm. From a literal standpoint, I think that's very accurate, right? Um, whether or not we're talking about box men or people on the fringes of society but just existing in you know any type of populated environment there is this feeling of anonymity that nobody is watching which is partially true and it's also partially true that everybody's watching right so I, that concept of going in and out of being a box man i think is core to where i think that these truly are different people because we all kind of go deeper or come out of that concept of being anonymous and how much you embrace it versus how much you you kind of struggle against it and i think that's that's a literal detail that you know when i walk around in the city and think who's actually paying attention to me i hope the answer is nobody but it's probably not nobody <laughs> right we all notice things and so i think it there's also just a question of what what are we sharing with the world how how are we being perceived and if you extrapolate that 
even further into modern times and the year that we're in versus when this was written. You know, we're documenting everything too in real time with our technology and our and our networks and things like it's that. It's all done through nice digital boxes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So we, we're fundamentally like we're replicating this concept to a far broader and a much faster degree. And that's, I think, a really important aspect to this, this unsettling feeling you get from this book is that that voyeurism is real. I mean, just open up anybody's Instagram account. And if you spend five minutes on it, you feel super weird at the end of it. You're like, why did I just do that? I don't even know this person at all. And maybe you guys are perfect. And you've I, never I don't done do that, that. Nick. That's, that's fine. That's weird. <laughs> I've never Weirdo. done this. I only look at I only look at my own Instagram account. And ask yourself, who is this person? Why am I spending five minutes? <laughs> yeah, right. Because we're all the same identity, man. The world is a box. Um, but yeah, I, I just that's it's super unsettling how much we submit to both being a voyeur and being watched. Those are all things that we think we're against, but yes, but yet we readily sign up for it every single day. Yeah, we even pay. You pay with your time, with your privacy, with, I mean, your bills. Putting your information online isn't free, and yet we do it. You're referring to our podcast yes. hosting service? <laughs> yes. And if you'd like to <laughs> offset some of those fees, we have merchandise available. Ooh. Good, because what this book is really about is consumerism. <laughs> <laughs> There's this quote that I've been waiting to read since the very beginning that I said I couldn't find, and I found it. And it also is kind of about consumerism. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug it right now. One's attention is caught willy-nilly by the hundred yen piece dropped on the road, but the bent and rusty nail in the weeds by the wayside may just as well not be there. On the average road, one usually manages not to go astray. However, as soon as one looks out of the box's observation window, things appear to be quite different. The various details of the scenery become homogenous, have equal significance. Cigarette butts, the sticky secretion in a dog's eye, the windows of a two-story house with the curtains waving, the creases in a flattened drum, rings biting into flabby fingers, railroad tracks leading into the distance, sacks of cement hardened because of moisture, dirt under the fingernails, loose manhole covers. But I am very fond of such scenery. That was, granted, more related to the photography thing, but the 100 yen net, I was like, here's my chance. <laughs> I don't know. I was going to take it into, I guess, another philosophical category of existentialism, which seems to be a big, a big thing in this book about what the fuck are you supposed to do in the face of absurdity? And we never really got to what this book says you should do other than jump in and just be absurd or is this all presupposition on our part that I, that I think that's the hard part for me is that the narrative never really gets much like it, it, it all feels too trapped inside the box so to speak and i think <laughs> that's why i i i don't know that i really enjoyed this book i guess i kind of enjoyed it it's weird um but like as opposed to say camu who's very much a moralist I did not get the feeling that Abe was moralizing, mostly. Mm. I think there are a couple morals, like maybe you should spend less time watching the news and more time you know, looking between the cracks at people and things. But as a whole, he's not like, and here's the solution, here's how we can fix it, here's what you should do. No. And I, I think there's a legitimate uh, reason why so many people, or at least they seem to have at once called him the Japanese Kafka because there's a lot of blending of absurd and a sort of mundane retelling of the absurd, where it feels so natural for the narrative and for the narrator to be telling these absurd things. And things happen as if in a dream without it ever feeling too shocking within the world of the narrative. Like it might be in the beginning when you're reading it, but then once you're in the book, like you're like, all right, that's just another crazy thing that happened because that's what happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it kind of fit in well with the Bakov's invitation to a beheading. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else got that vibe, but Gnostical (laughs) Turpitude, basically, you know, the premise itself being so absurd. I think one of the reasons that I did like this book was that it didn't try to head into moral territory. And I think that's 
that's an important decision by the author to kind of keep it at the level that it is. Because I think if you were to try to turn turn this into some sort of moral tale, you would lose some of the fundamental, I don't know, the weirdness, the the oddities, the the vague aspect that allows this type of conversation to exist. I think if he turned the corner into, and here's the moral, then it would very quickly wrap itself up into some sort of specific idea that, quite frankly, a lot of us would, I expect, agree with, right? Voyeurism's pretty fundamentally weird. We treat people on the fringes of society as not existing. We basically push them into anonymity. And doesn't that make you feel terrible as a human being? I think that could easily be the straightforward moral that's applied to this. But he doesn't he doesn't go there. He just lays out the absurd scenarios of it. And I think if you're a writer, knowing when to stop that is important because that's what, I don't know, that's what to me the definition of literature is. It's the thing that you can point to and say, oh yeah, that makes sense to me. But they're not necessarily just, you know, saying an mm-hmm. end point. And as we read so many books on this podcast, there's that's such a fine line, but some authors just blow past it and they're like, I'm going to tell you what the moral is. East and of other Eden. authors are just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're still railing on East of Eden, what, like 10 episodes <laughs> later? Um, and yet I still like that book. I still like <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's very different. And I think what makes this book successful, Nick, and you said it exactly right, is there is a sense that those moral issues are there behind the surface without being explicit. And it's not, it doesn't feel absurd for absurd sake either. I don't know if you've ever tried reading some surrealist fiction where it's just random nonsense, almost dreamlike to the point of, okay, this is pointless. Mm-hmm. It's not getting at anything. And it's also not even telling a story well. Mm. And I think Abe, it's hard to say in translation, but his style isn't, it's nothing spectacular. And I think coming off of Lispector where style was so important where form was such a big part of that i i think here it's well paced he has those really funny bizarre introductions to chapters and there's enough of a movement in narrative where that you're you're pulled along you're kind of following things even if if you don't necessarily know what's really happening there's enough there to keep you going and i think that's really good and i think it's an important thing for a, a book like this to do well said Uh, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And there's our ending. Thanks for listening. You can find out more about us at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Twitter and Instagram with the handle booksosubstance. Please like, subscribe, press buttons on the internet, do all that thing that helps contribute to your voyeurism. We're into it. You're into it. That works. And also, if you really liked it, don't forget that there is Boss merchandise, cool shirts and hats and things that you can wear inside of or outside of a box. Your decision. But any amount of support helps. We appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I uh, I'm gonna I can stick it I'll stick it right now this is it.